My heartiest good wishes to all of you who are about to receive your degrees, both undergraduate and graduate. Believe me, you heard from the pedigree, that I put forth effort and perseverance, as did you, and I know how much it has taken to bring you to this day. As the college historian, I am honored and privileged to start speak to you today. McDaniel College has com will complete its first 150 years of its existence in about 75 minutes. And we will launch a year-long celebration of our sesquicentennial, a very special event for anyone associated with or interested in this grand old institution. While I was not around for the founding of the college in 1867, <laughs> I was here on the faculty when we celebrated our centennial. And here we are 50 years later, still going strong. I hope you will all come back for homecoming on October the 21st when we hold our big 150th birthday party. Watch for details. In the next few minutes, I am going to highlight a few of the major eras, events, people, incidents, and even some pranks that have brought us to this significant place today. I hope this will give everyone a better appreciation of this venerable institution of coeducational liberal arts education. The college founded as Western Maryland College has its roots in a preparatory school run by Fayette R. Buell in the stone house we now call Rembert House. Mr. Buell, assisted by the Reverend James T. Ward, a retired minister of the Methodist Protestant Church, gathered support for establishing a college here in Westminster, purchased land on the top of the hill, and by the fall of 1867 had built, but not paid for, a building we eventually called Old Main. Let's go back to that first day of classes, September the 4th. Seniors, now I'm gonna address only you, I want you to imagine for a moment that you are one of those 30 students gathered in a still unfinished building to learn about the college, the first coeducational college below the Mason-Dixon line. You soon learn that you will study all the same courses though men and women will be totally separated from their, in, in their classes and everything else until 1920. Here is your freshman schedule. English grammar and composition, geography, history, natural philosophy, we call it biology, chemistry, arithmetic and or algebra according to placement, and, are you ready for this? Latin grammar, Greek grammar, German grammar, and French grammar. Sounds like fun. <laughs> All of these classes will be taught by a faculty of seven, only one of whom held a college degree. And you will be subject to many rules of deportment. Don't they look interesting? Fast forward to your commencement four years later, on June 15, 1871. Seven of you, that's all that made it through, four men and three women, will receive the Bachelor of Arts degree during the ceremony. There were no earned master's degrees, by the way, until 1935. The ladies are dressed in their best finery. The men in their frock coats and flashy ties, caps and gowns, did not appear until 1895. President Ward had given the baccalaureate sermon and now confers degrees and presents to you the hand-lettered diploma written in Latin, which had also been signed by the entire faculty. He then proceeds to address you again in Latin. In subsequent commencements, valedictorians also presented orations in Latin. Don't worry, we're not gonna ask Julie to talk to us in Latin today. Dr. George Wills commented on this 19th century custom that though the occasion was serious, it had its humorous side since an audience of perhaps a thousand people or more would be listening with apparent rapt attention to the speakers who were talking in a language that few could understand. Interesting image. One more comment about these early days of the college is necessary. After that opening day in 1867, Buell, who still owned the college, worked mightily to raise funds to pay off the debts, but was unsuccessful and essentially was forced to declare bankruptcy. A new board of trustees of 36 local citizens Methodist ministers and the statewide representatives was formed and each pledging financial support and they bought the college from Mr. Buell and had it chartered by the state 
of Maryland in March 30, on March 30, 1868. From that moment on, the college was a private liberal arts college owned by the trustees and under the patronage, but not the control, of the Methodist Protestant Church, which rarely contributed much financial help. Many years later, the last living trustee, Dr. Joshua Herring, commented, and in a very serious way, if we had known in advance all the difficulties to be met and overcome, I doubt very much whether we would have had the courage and faith to undertake the work at all. But they soldiered on, never faltered in adversity, and here we are today. J.T. Ward, a beloved and admired teacher, retired in 1886 to become the president of the Methodist Seminary on the adjacent property, and his son-in-law, Thomas Hamilton Lewis, the founding seminar president, replaced him. No nepotism in those days. Lewis, a graduate of 1875, was, very, was a very able administrator, and in two years was able, with successful fundraising and careful budgeting and a lot of begging, to pay off the $25,000 debt he inherited. During his 34-year presidency, the college grew incrementally, the curriculum evolved slowly, a number of new buildings were added to the campus through successful fundraising, the college weathered the Great War, and it moved slowly but successfully into the 20th century. Lewis was aided tremendously by his treasurer and later vice president, William Roberts McDaniel, class of 1880, who was also professor of mathematics and astronomy. The students respected Dr. Lewis, who was very formal and not a not very approachable man, I'm told. They called him the Great Stone Face. But they loved Dr. McDaniel, nicknamed Billy Mac. Who wouldn't love a mathematics professor? <laughs> Especially when he acted as president in Lewis's several absences during the two years, 1902 to 4, when Lewis was simultaneously the president of Adrian College in Michigan. Adrian was in financial stress, and Lewis went out to save them. In 1910, the students did express their feelings toward him in a poem in the last page of the senior yearbook. The innocuous poem, Veil, contained an acrostic that spelled vertically down, Doc Lewis is a horse's ass. <laughs> of course, Lewis found out about it tried in vain to find out who wrote it, stewed a bit, and then solved the problem by banning the publication of the yearbook for the next six years. <laughs> Legend has it that the anonymous author was none other than the valedictorian and class president, Robert Joshua Gill, for whom this building is named. The college moved forwardly, forward rapidly in the post-war years under the leadership of Albert Norman Ward, class of 1895, who was a 20th century thinker and a grand, with grand visions for a greater Western Maryland. Coeducational classes were scheduled for the first time. Yes, for the first time. Elective class courses also appeared. Campus rules were loosened up so the students could now walk downtown together without chaperones, and they could even dance. The literary societies, a mainstay of 19th century social life, gave way to fraternities and sororities in the mid-20s, even if the trustees <clears throat> didn't officially recognize them for another decade. Ward continued to be ably assisted by McDaniel, though both suffered from long-term illnesses. McDaniel had turned down the presidency in 1920 for health reasons, but he continued his administrative roles through Ward's 15-year tenure. Ward, along with some support from trustees, including Robert J. Gill, also promoted an increased interest in athletics and hired Richard Harlow. In a nine-year stint as head football coach and athletic director, new sports were added and the football team became a power to be reckoned with, with the likes of the University of Maryland, Boston College, Wake Forest, and Penn State, leading to three undefeated seasons, national rankings, and an invitation to play in the first Orange Bowl. WMC declined so that several of our best players could play in the Shrine East-West game on January 1. Bill Shepard played 59 of 60 minutes and was named MVP of the game, even though his team lost. An incident occurred during this time that suggests the growing activism among students of the era. Students have always complained about dining hall food, 
I know I did in the 1950s, liver every other Thursday night. Ugh. But one Saturday night, they were, the students were served pickled souse. If you're not familiar with this delicacy, I usually describe it as about three levels down from Scrapple, combined in a vinegary gelatin, everything left from the butchered pig except the squeal. The students revolted, walked out of the dining room, much to Dr. Ward's consternation. Discussions were held with a dietitian, compromises were reached, and the students never saw pickled souse again. Dr. Ward's sudden fatal heart attack at the beginning of 1935-36, perhaps brought on by the pressures of keeping the college afloat during the Depression, raised significant problems for the college tackled by a faculty committee until its successor was named Fred Garrigus Holloway, class of 1918, and president of the neighboring seminary. He assumed the presidency in December, but did not have the loyal support of McDaniel, his old teacher, because McDaniel was suffering from Parkinson's disease, which would claim his life in April 1942 at the age of 80. Holloway is remembered for working to raise the academic standards of the college while also building three critical buildings, including two dormitories and a new gymnasium, the gymnasium over there, raising funds even in the Depression. When he resigned in 1947 to become the president of Drew University, Holloway summarized his presidency. Again, in a serious way. I doubt that any period of American higher education has presented so many different and unusual circumstances as the past 12 years. Between 1935 and 39, we were coping with the problems of the Depression. Between 39 and 41, we were in the pre-war era. From 41 to 45, we were facing the varied and constantly changing problems of the war era. Since then, we have met the flood tide of post-war GI Bill enrollments. However, when everything else is considered, I believe we can proudly say that we are doing an honest educational job. An important wartime effort was the college's participation in the Army Special Training Program, in which 300 men arrived on campus in July 1943 for specialized pre-engineering training in science and mathematics. This, their program, however, was aborted just nine months later when the war intensified and the soldiers were sent off to Europe. Dr. Holloway is remembered as one who devoted his life to education and the life of the mind, and as one who kept the college on the right track during the Depression and World War II. I remember meeting him several times when he returned to campus, especially when his class celebrated their 50th reunion in 1968. At the alumni banquet, he and another classmate delighted the audience with a hearty rendition of their class yell. We're, we're long-standing traditions. Holika, halika, halika, ha, chick da, boom ta, sis, boon ra, 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 re, ji roar, ji roar, Gloria, atque, virtus par, yakety ya, yakety you, ya ye, rackety re, first a straight and then an eight. That's what we are here to state. Susa, maraca, maraca, marine, 1918. Yells went out in the 20s, but we'll line you up outside and you get ready to do your yell today. Holloway was succeeded by Lowell S. Enzer, a local Methodist minister and the first non-alumnus, one who, with strong administrative and people skills that held him in good stead for his 25-year presidency. Enzer was a very successful fundraiser, and during his tenure, the campus was changed radically by the raising of all the old buildings on the top of the campus, to be replaced by the first student center, we know it as Winslow, Baker Memorial Chapel, a new library, as well as three dormitories, a science addition to Lewis Hall, and an infirmary. We absorbed the seminary property, renamed Elder Dice Hall, when the seminary moved to Washington to become the Wesley Theological Seminary. Between 1947 and 1972, the college defended itself in first, the first of two lawsuits regarding state aid to church-related colleges, such celebrated its centennial in 1967-68 with a the theme, Continuity and Change, I would submit it's probably still appropriate today. Began the January term in 1970 and integrated the campus by the mid-60s. It saw its enrollment grow from 600 to 1,100, its faculty grow by 50%, its staff double, and its endowment quadruple. And we welcomed the Baltimore Colts for summer practice for 19 years. It was a very busy, and significant 25 years. I knew Lowell Enzer well, 
he signed my diploma, and he hired me. And I was always impressed with his unflappability and his goodwill. He was once described by a friend of mine as a wonderful gentleman who could tell you to go to hell and you would look forward to the journey. <laughs> a rather famous incident occurred in February 1949 when a senior English major, Cecil Eby, decided to perform a chemistry experiment. He threw sodium into a toilet on the fourth floor of Albert Norman Ward Hall. The porcelain crumpled like a sick elephant. That picture was taken by an eyewitness, by the way, Richard Layton, class of 52. Arriving on the scene and seeing the waterfall casting, cascading down the stairway, the dean of men had one word for him, pack. Evie left the campus to complete his degree elsewhere. But that is not the end of the story. E.B. earned a master's degree and a doctoral uh, degree, was a Fulbright lecturer, became professor of English at the University of Michigan, but he craved his Western Maryland bachelor's degree, as do all of you, and some of you for master's degrees. So eventually he petitioned the college to grant it based on his later accomplishments, if not his prowess in chemistry. At the 1988 commencement, Cecil Eby strode across this stage in his doctoral regalia to receive his bachelor's diploma. All was forgiven. Ralph Candler John succeeded Enzer in 1972 and immediately modified the campus culture by abolishing curfews for women and persuading the trustees to approve alcohol on campus. <laughs> Thought that might get a rise out of you. <laughs> he also revamped the administrative structure, creating divisions and vice presidents. He oversaw the building of the Decker College Center, the Garden Apartments, this Gill Center. He and his staff successfully steered the college through the rather tense and turbulent 1970s without serious incidents, except for a number of daring young men who assisted on streaking through the dining hall and around the women's dormitories. Title IX encouraged women's athletic programs to grow, and in 1978, we established the college's Sports Hall of Fame. Probably the most significant event occurring, occurred in 1974 with the formal dissolution of any ties with the Methodist Church, making WMC a totally private, independent college. Dr. John always said, however, that he was most proud of the creation of the first principles in 1981, and we've been living by those principles ever since and the establishment of the Delta of Maryland chapter of Phi Beta Kappa in 1980. One amusing and ironic incident occurred in this era. As the Decker College Center was being planned in 1976, the students, through the SGA and the newspaper, expressed considerable unhappiness that the sighting would crowd the center of the campus, that many trees would be lost, and that the students had been asked their opinion. The center was built, of course, and two years later, the newspaper editorials praised the placement of the building because it was in the center of the campus and easily accessible. Who knew? Interestingly, and again ironically, in 1973, student editors took issue with the college's then name, suggesting that it should be changed so that outsiders would finally know we're not in Garrett County or a state college. What foresight? It only took 25 years to get it done. Time is moving on and you want to get to your diplomas, so I will merely summarize a few of the major developments in the last 30 years during the administrations of Robert Chambers and, and Joan Devlin Coley. I'm gonna leave Dr. Casey out because you've been here most of his tenure, so you know what went on. Under Dr. Chambers' leadership in a somewhat volatile economy, we built a large addition to the Hoover Library in 1991, endured two fires in Blanche Ward and Guild Gymnasium, helped create the Centennial Athletic Conference, built the college conference center and motel, expanded the Lewis complex with the Eaton Science Hall, and opened a second campus in Budapest. Dr. Coley raised the endowment to almost $100 million, encouraged increasing campus diversity, oversaw the building of Merritt Hall and the North Village, expanded this Gill Center, began planning for the new stadium, and most significantly, led the college through the name change in 2002 to honor the venerable William Roberts McDaniel. There are many things I could add to the list, and, and I've omitted many of the details, of course, but I do know a good book you can read if you want to fill in the gaps. <laughs> in closing, 
I wish for all of you, graduates, health and prosperity as you venture forth into work, professions, community service, and life. The Military Academy at West Point has its long gray line. And today, as we march out and into our 151st year, you will join the long green line, composed of over 35,000 graduates over the past 147 years. May I urge you to take pride in your solid liberal arts education, esteem your alma mater that changed your life, and glory in its historic past. Come back to the Hill often. Keep us posted on your successes. Be a good ambassador and help us to grow the fund for McDaniel so that we can, as our motto says, continue to call future generations of students from darkness unto light. Good wishes to you all. See you at homecoming.